If Jesus was here this morning, what would he say? What would he say about this church and how we are doing and where we stand before the Lord? Well, of course, Jesus is here this morning. And oh, we are fortunate, we are blessed to have in our New Testaments seven letters in which Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, evaluates seven churches in the province of Rome and Asia, which I think represent the churches of God of all times and all places. And we look at the first of those this morning, the letter from Jesus written through John to the church at Ephesus. And I will invite you uh, to give your good attention this morning and to follow along in the text of your Bible in front of you. Of the seven churches, we actually know uh, a lot about the church at Ephesus and virtually nothing about the rest of them. But the church at Ephesus, John writing perhaps in the 90s, the year of our Lord, has a long and storied history. You may remember that Paul spent quite a bit of time in Ephesus, maybe as many as three years. And there are some amazing phrases used about Paul's time in the city of Ephesus. It talks about the word of the Lord spreading so that all in the region, both Jew and Greek, heard. It talks about people, because of the miracles of Paul, fearing and extolling the name of Jesus. You may remember that on one instance, the Christians repented of their sinful ways, and they took their books of magic and sorcery and burned them up, getting rid of them completely. And Luke says that 50,000 pieces of silver's worth of property was destroyed by the Christians in their repentance. And it talks about, in maybe a summary statement, that in Ephesus and in the region of Asia, the word of the Lord uh, prevailed and increased mightily. An amazing history in the early years of the church at Ephesus. And they benefited not only from the work of the Apostle Paul, those three years that he was there, but we read and we're studying on our Monday night Zoom class the letters written by Paul to Timothy. And Paul has left Timothy in Ephesus for him to work, to do the work of an evangelist and to preach the gospel there. And Timothy, it seems, spent several years in the city of Ephesus. And History tells us, and it would make some sense, that the Apostle John ended up spending quite a few years in the city of Ephesus, working with this church before he was exiled to the island of Patmos, from which he writes the book of Revelation. And throughout this history and the writings, as we said, quite a few writings in the New Testament that we have related to the church at Ephesus, there is a common theme that shows up over and over again, which is... Guarding against false teaching. Paul, in Acts chapter 20, meets with the Ephesian elders for what will likely be the last time that they will see each other. And he talks in that chapter about a warning that savage wolves will come in from among your own selves, he said. Perhaps meaning even the eldership. False people, false teachers would come in. And Paul gives a very sobering and stern warning about that. If you've been in our Monday night class, you'll uh, remember offhand, and we'll continue to see in 2 Timothy, that those two letters from Paul to Timothy, almost every section of those books deals with false teachers that Timothy must confront and the truth that he must teach to make sure that, that the truth is preserved, that this great uh, trust has been uh, given to him and that he would be a good steward of it. Over and over again, this theme comes up related to the church at Ephesus. Well, before we look at uh, their performance evaluation given in Revelation 2, I want us to think about the fact that it's at least possible that there are similarities between the church at Ephesus in the first century and the church that meets here in Bel Air in the 21st century. We ourselves here have quite a long and storied history, do we not? Um, and there's been a lot of people, a lot of wonderful people that have been a part of this church for the last 60 some odd years that it has been in existence. And it's one of those uh, uh, cool things about being at Bel Air, when you visit virtually anywhere in the Houston area, maybe even in southeast Texas, you are bound to come upon at least one person, if not multiple people, that at one point in time were here. And they have gone from here, and now they are teachers and elders and foundational members and other places 
around the region. And you probably know, uh, and we should remember, that for years this congregation sent money all over the world so that the gospel could be preached, supporting evangelists uh, on every continent, I would guess. The word has gone from here all over, and we must thank God for how he has used this congregation in that regard. And we have benefited, too, in that storied history. You should do this, uh, whether you've been here for a long time or not. Uh, you can go to our website. There's 256 pages of, of sermons on the website. You can go back all the way, largely thanks to people like Johnny Martinez and Robert that have been involved uh, Robert McDonald in recording and posting those sermons. All the way back to the 70s, people like Bill McQuistian and W.R. Jones and John Clark, David Lanius, Jack Smith, Steve Garrett, through the years that have labored here, people that are known far and wide for their faithfulness as ministers of the gospel. And this church has benefited from that, not to mention the people that have come just to speak on occasion as well. And I would suggest that there has been an uh, emphasis, and I think this is still true and probably has been true here for a long time, there is an emphasis on sound teaching, that we emphasize the fact that, that we want to preserve the truth, that we don't want it to be compromised, we don't want error to come in, we don't want false teaching to be brought in. I bet if you pay attention to the prayers that are prayed in the assembly, the sermons that are preached, the classes that are taught, again, in the present as well as in the past, you would see that this has been and is a great emphasis of this church. Well, uh, whether we are more or less similar to the church at Ephesus, let's at least read the letter uh, from the mouth of our Lord in Revelation 2, verse 1 to 7, and see ourselves in the mirror of God's word. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this. I know your deeds and your toil, your perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to, test, put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. You have found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Just to overview quickly, we uh, mentioned last month in previewing these seven letters that they all follow a very similar pattern. Jesus begins by introducing himself. All of these images drawn from chapter 1 and the vision that John saw of the exalted uh, Messiah. But in this letter in particular, he calls upon himself, Jesus, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. We're actually told in chapter 1, verse 20, that the stars represent the angels of the churches, and the seven golden lampstands represent the churches themselves. The lampstand is probably easier for us to understand, that Jesus is walking among his people. He is there with them. What the angels of the churches are? That's a much harder question. Some have said this is just the messengers, uh, human messengers, tasked to carry these letters to the churches. Some have said that these are actually spiritual beings that in some way are associated or represent each of these churches in the presence of God. Regardless, it is clear that Jesus says, I am with my people, with them to protect them, with them to know them inside and out. And with them to remove them from their place before God, if necessary. And Jesus does know them, of course. But he starts by saying that he knows the good that they have done. Let me just say this. Jesus does not forget, does not lose sight of, the hard work that is done in his name. 
There are some people here, uh, some of us that have labored to be faithful to the Lord for decades. That is not lost on Jesus. He knows the work that we put in day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. It is not lost on him. He knows. We should be comforted by that. And he knows the good work that the church at Ephesus has done, particularly in two areas, the toil, the uh, tireless commitment to remaining faithful, as well as the weeding out of error, whether that's evil men or false apostles. But, as will be the focus of our lesson, Jesus says, I have this against you. This is his charge. You have left your first love. And they must repent or Jesus will remove their place before God. But that is not the last word of the letter. Yes, they will be removed if they do not repent, regain that love and the works that they had at the first. But the one who hears, the one who overcomes, will be in the presence of God forever as his reward. Well, let's focus on this idea of they left their first love. What does that mean? I think it's very natural to think of something else that Jesus said during the time of his ministry. For instance, in Matthew chapter 22, when he was asked by somebody, what is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus said this famously, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, Jesus says. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole of the law and the prophets. It seems as though for all of the strength, all of the purity, All of the faithfulness and the work that was done in the church at Ephesus over many years, it was, at least it wasn't any longer, built on this foundation. On a foundation of loving God, their God, with all of their heart, their soul, their mind, and their strength. And that is no small thing. You may remember that in the opening verses of 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, clearly trying to use as much hyperbole as possible, you could do the most amazing things imaginable. Give your body to be burned. Give all your possessions to the poor. Speak in the tongues of angels. But Paul says, if I have not love, it is nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Nothing. It is worthless. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 22. Love is the foundation. Love for God. You love it. You truly love God with all your heart. Everything else is going to follow very naturally. Not necessarily easily. It's still a struggle. But you love God. You are willing to do everything for him. And everything is done for him. But the reverse of that, of course, is that without a love for God, well, one, why would you do everything else? But even if you did do everything else, without this as the centerpiece, the other things mean nothing. This, I believe, is what has happened in the church at Ephesus. And so the question would be, well, how does that happen? How does a church like Ephesus lose its first love? couple things I want to say uh, to, to start. One is that a church only loses its first love if the people in the church lose their first love. A church is simply a group of people. And so a church cannot drift from this calling unless I and you and we as people lose our calling, our love for God. There is, of course, in these letters written to the churches of Asia, anytime we're talking about a church being what it should be, there is, of course, 
a special charge to the elders who oversee the congregation who are responsible, the Bible says, for the souls of the flock, the people that they watch over. Yes, they have a special charge in all of this. Yes, people like Steve and I and others that are responsible for teaching publicly on a regular basis in a church. Like Timothy, Paul says over and over, I solemnly charge you, Timothy. Yes, we have a charge. But the church is people, after all, is it not? And so that's where this starts and where it ends. And the other thing I would say is that one of the lessons, perhaps, of the story of Ephesus is the corrosive force that is time. Doesn't time ruin everything? That over time, that is the natural way that things go. I'm not an engineer, but I think it's the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, hey, look at Michael, because he's going over all that, maybe. Everything tends towards disorder. Everything falls apart. And people fall apart. The passing of time brings drifting of purpose, a drifting of identity, a drifting of principles. That is only if we do nothing. With no effort, with no care or attention, just like your brand new house or your brand new car, just give it some time. And no work, no care, nothing done, and that is just naturally what is going to happen. And I think people are the same way. We cannot afford to do nothing if we want to avoid uh, the path of Ephesus in Revelation 2. What happened, though, to be specific? Well, I don't know if we can know for sure, but I'll suggest a few things. One thing I might ask is, is it possible that the church in Ephesus forgot God's love for them and then they began to labor on for other reasons. 1 John 4, 19, that letter perhaps written by the Apostle John while he was in Ephesus. But 1 John 4, 19, simple and memorable. We love. Why? We love because he first loved us. And we may remember that in Ephesians, the letter written to the church at Ephesus, presumably, Paul spends the first three chapters of that letter emphasizing what God has done for us. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons in chapter 1. The great love with which he loved us, chapter 2, by grace you have been saved. And then in chapter 3, as he ends that first section of the letter, he prays that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Brian referenced this verse around the Lord's table this morning and pointed out accurately that this is an impossible thing to do. It is impossible for us to grasp the love of God, and, and that's the why, why Paul describes it the way that he does. But that is our lifetime pursuit. To appreciate, to think on, to meditate, to try to understand God's love for us. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And when we think on and when we appreciate, we dwell in the love that God has had for us, the sacrifice of His Son, the mercy and the grace that He has shown to us, the kindness and the patience that he continues to show towards weak and sinful and feeble people like me and like you, then we would be rooted and grounded, as Paul says, so that everything that we are, everything that we do, comes back to the love of God. Maybe that's what happened in Ephesus, that they stopped being rooted and grounded in love. They continued to work, but not because of their love for God, but maybe for other things. We could speculate about those things, what they might be. But maybe we should just ask for ourselves. Why do we do all the things that we are doing? All the work that, that we might be involved in or busy about in this congregation. Why are we doing it? Is it because well, it's just what we've always done? 
it's easy enough to continue on, kind of go in cruise control and, and keep at what we've always been doing, more comfortable that way? Is it because we're the church of Christ? You know, that's a tricky phrase we need to be careful about. What that phrase is, what that means, the church of Christ, that is simply, at least it's supposed to be, just a description. We are a group of people. We are a church. We are a church that belongs to Christ. He is our king. He is our shepherd. He is our Lord. We swear our allegiance to him. We follow him. We obey him. We love him. Unfortunately, though, that phrase kind of becomes one thing, and it becomes like the name of our club. And, well, we're in the club called Church of Christ, so that's why we do X, Y, Z. That's why we're here right now on Sundays, because we're Church of Christ. You see, where the, one, where the emphasis of that is, it's on us, what we're doing. But also it misses completely the love that we have for Jesus, our Lord, and our faithfulness to him, our King. Why do we do all the things that we are doing? And is it because God loved us and we love him with all of our heart, soul, and mind? But is it possible that uh, in, in Ephesus, the church there began to, over time, define themselves by what they were not? This is what I mean by this. We notice that in the letter written by Jesus, or by John, uh, from Jesus in chapter 2 of Revelation... Remember that the Ephesian church was really good at staying away from the bad stuff, right? They had, they had mastered that. False apostles, they had tested them, known they were false, and removed them. They had not tolerated evil. They hated, uh, down at the, towards the end of that letter, they hated what God hates. They stayed away from the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which we'll probably get to in another lesson, although we don't know much about them. But... A church, we as Christians, our responsibility, our calling is not just to stay away from the bad stuff and to reject evil and to resist false teaching. It is, in fact, to actively work for our Lord. Paul says this much, uh, personally speaking, for each of us in Ephesians 4. He talks about laying aside the old self, which is corrupted according to the lust of deceit, and not just to put off the old self, we stop sinning, but he says that we are renewed in the spirit of your mind to put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And then maybe most powerfully, most relevant perhaps to uh, the church at Ephesus, the encouragement that Paul gives Timothy it just strikes me, especially as someone uh, charged with teaching the word on a regular basis. First Timothy 1, verse 3, Paul tells Timothy, I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on in Ephesus, so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to, rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. So, Timothy... Instruct people to stay away from all of those false teachings. But Paul doesn't stop there. He says, but the goal of our instruction is love. From a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. The purpose of our teaching is not just to avoid error. The purpose of our teaching is to create, to generate, to produce in ourselves love. And a good conscience and a sincere faith. Maybe, perhaps, the church at Ephesus got the first of those, but missed the rest of that. And so, whether or not that's the case, we can at least ask ourselves. How do we define ourselves as Christians and as a church? Think about our, our morality for ourselves, and maybe this comes to light especially in the way that we raise our kids. What are, we, what are we emphasizing in terms of the lives that we live? Simply the, oh, well, I'm a Christian, so I don't do this and this. What is it, something like drink, smoke, and chew, and hang out with those who do? You know? We don't do all those things, all those bad things. We stay away from it. Don't do this, don't do this. 
We tell our kids, don't do this, don't do that. What are we supposed to be doing? What, do, what do Christians do? <laughs> okay, yeah, we know what they don't do. But what, what are they spending their time doing? What are they busy with? What are they active in? I feel like that's kind of a harder question for us to answer. But it shouldn't be. Because if we're committed to sound doctrine, then it should be generating in us love, action, faithfulness. But maybe doctrinally, we could ask the same question. Again, is it easier to ask the, or answer the question, what do, we believe, what do we not believe in? What do we not do as a church? We have all those things down. We don't use instruments. We're not Calvinists. But what, what do we believe? The other day, I was talking to Brian, and he talked about some of these basic terms that we use, like eternal life. That was the example he gave. Can we say and answer biblically and positively, what is eternal life? What does that mean? What are the things that we believe, that I believe, that the Bible teaches? Not simply, what are the things that we are supposed to avoid? Maybe that was part of the problem, the church in Ephesus. And then, finally, uh, for these speculations, I'll ask, maybe the church at Ephesus, on top of all of this, or because of all of this, stopped loving each other. Remember back to Matthew 22, this is not a different subject. Jesus himself brought together, inseparably, love for God, the first and greatest commandment, and the second like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. A church that loves God, people that love God with all of their heart, will love each other. And people, church, that doesn't love each other does not truly love God. John is the one that said that, not me. Uh, in 1 John 5, I don't have this one up on the screen, but 1 John 5, 20, if someone says, I love God, we probably would all say that, right? If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. It's automatic. It's necessary. You love God, you love others. And this also, it turns out, was a heavy emphasis of Paul for the Ephesian elders. As well as saying all the things about warning against the savage wolves in Acts chapter 20, one of the very last things in that emotional meeting that Paul said in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, was, In everything I showed you, that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Again, this is a clear command for elders in a church. Help the weak. Look out for those who are struggling. Check in on them. Support them. Hold up their hands. Pray with them. But it's a command for all of us as well. Jesus' words, it's more blessed to give than to receive. That would be true for all of us. And in Ephesians, after laying out the great love and calling that we have from God... He spends chapters 4, 5, and 6 talking about the love that we should have while walking worthily according to the calling. And maybe everything is encapsulated here in Ephesians 4, verse 31 and following. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Love is imitation. And so if we truly love God with all of our heart, we will do what he is. We will be what he is. We will do what he has done. That is to walk in love, to pour out ourselves for other people. And so, has our love for each other grown cold? Coming to church is great. I'm uh, in favor of it. But remember that in that famous verse in Hebrews chapter 10 that says not to forsake the assembly of the, the Christians together, 
the Hebrew writer says that the whole purpose of us coming together is to stir up one another to love and good works. That's what we're doing here. And if we're here and not doing that, then what's the good of being here? So, do we love one another actively, sacrificially, selflessly? Do we know each other? Spend time with each other? Do we know? Remember that charge in Acts 20? Paul's intense focus, helping the weak. It's not the only place throughout Paul's letters. Looking out for the weak, those who need help, those who are struggling. Do we know who that is? Do we know who is struggling? And do we reach out to them? The church at Ephesus had lost their first love. Perhaps they lost sight of God's love for them. Perhaps they got focused more on the what they were not than what they were. Perhaps they started, stopped loving each other. Maybe all of this, maybe some of this defines me as an individual, defines us, or characterizes us as a church. But what does Jesus command? Two things that he says in the letter that we'll end with. One is to remember. First thing I want us to do is not do anything. I want us to just, to, just to think. Just to reflect. If you think back, uh, if you've been a Christian for any time at all, then you'll know it's the case that there are ups and there are downs. Can you think back to a time where your love was fervent? More fervent, perhaps, than it is now. Faith was more sincere. We think back as a church, perhaps, to things that, that we were, that we had done in the past. That kind of reflection is important to understand where we've come from, to understand where we want to go. Was there, was there a time when we had more zeal, more love? And if it's the case that we've lost some of that as individuals or as a congregation, then why? Why has that happened? Jesus first says, remember from where you have fallen. Think back to that time in your life. What was different? Why are you where you are now? And then Jesus says, in no uncertain terms, repent. Twice, actually. He says that in this letter. Repent. Confess those wrongs. Make the change. Do the things that you know that you can do. Yes, this lesson is a lot about motivation. It's a lot about purpose. We've left, you left your first love, he tells the church at Ephesus. We remember that everything we do, we do for the Lord and not for ourselves. But don't miss that Jesus says in that, repent and do the works you did at first. There were things that they had, had been doing that they were not doing anymore. They needed to start doing again. What is it that we, in our earlier fervor for the Lord, were doing? We're first Christians. We were new. We were excited about the Lord. Any Bible class that was going on, we were there. We wanted to participate. We wanted to learn. Any opportunity for study. We had a habit of prayer. We were always talking to people about the Lord. Trying to strike up conversations with our brothers and sisters about spiritual things. If those are the things we've done in the past, we're not doing any more, then there's repentance that needs to happen. Change that needs to be made. Things that need to be done. And as I learned from my brother Harrison Banks, if there's something that you know needs to be done, and you can do it, then it's your responsibility to do that. And so don't catch yourself saying, oh, you know, we used to do such and such thing around here. It would be really great if someone started doing that again. Well, why don't you do it? Or, you know, there's this great idea I had. This would be really, really wonderful if this was done. But why don't you do it? Think, reflect, make the change, do what there is to do. But in the end, uh, not, all of that you knew. <laughs> None of that was new to you. And so Jesus says, as he often did, he who has an ear, let him hear. It comes down to our hearts. Are our hearts receptive and soft enough to hear the words of God? and to let them take root in our hearts, and to bear fruit in a changed life. But Jesus says, The one who overcomes I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. I think I've referred, be, referred before to uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Regardless of that as a whole, the first item on that list is, 
What is the chief end of man? And the answer is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's what Jesus is promising in Revelation 2, 7. To be in the presence of God and to enjoy him forever. And if that's not our motivation for every single thing that we do, then we've missed it. And so we'll sing a song. Oh, the depth of the riches of God's saving grace. Has that grace made you what you are? Has it transformed you? Do you need his saving grace to be transformed, to be forgiven today, or can you make a change that we can help you with? Either way, let's reflect on these things. Come to the front if you need to as we stand and sing the song.